there becomes a point when you know when if you're becoming so dehydrated sodium depleted blood volumes dropping so much that your performance is going to fall off you're going to need to drink something and absorb it for it to have a, a, a cast iron physiological effect but like you said that book alex's book was was so good at, at pointing out how blurred that line is between what is a psychological effect and what is a physiological effect and the fact that the two are effectively intertwined. Hey friends, Jeffrey Wu here and welcome to another episode of the HVMN podcast. Hydration. There's much more to it than just drinking water. Like everything in the human system, there's nuance. And that means there's room to optimize it according to your own biology, needs, and goals. This week, I talked to Andy Blow. He's a triathlete and a sports scientist who had suffered from serious cramps through his athletic career. There are many reasons why people cramp, and a key mechanism is through dehydration and poor electrolyte replenishment. All athletes sweat, yet there's a huge variance in sweat and sodium loss, which can lead to suboptimal performance, and you guessed it, cramps. To combat this problem, Andy founded Precision Hydration to help a number of elite athletes in NFL, NBA, and the MLB, and endurance athletes meet their personalized hydration and electrolyte needs. In this podcast, Andy and I discuss the misconceptions behind hydration and electrolytes, how endurance athletes tend to lean more into the quantified self-philosophy than other types of athletes, and the physiology behind cramping. If you're tuning in via audio, remember to hit that subscribe button for weekly episodes. For folks watching on YouTube, please subscribe as well. But also hit that bell next to the red subscribe button. YouTube isn't perfect and doesn't always notify you when we post a video. So click on that bell to not miss out. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Andy, awesome to finally connect and have you on the program. Yeah, great to be here, Jeff. Thanks for inviting me. So you have an English accent. Are you calling in from... London, UK? Uh, not far from London. I'm about mm, two hours southwest of London on the south coast. Okay, okay, great. So here it's quite muggy yeah. this 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 time. I mean, I, I don't know what it's like typically in summer of England, but I imagine, well, I, I hear it's a little bit muggier than usual. Yeah, we um, and, it, and it, we had about two inches of rain yesterday. So business as usual over okay. here. <laughs> so water, hydration, that's your wheelhouse. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about the technology and the history of precision hydration. So from a layman and a, and a customer, um, you know, as we all sweat, uh, we all have different electrolyte demands and requirements as we sweat different levels of electrolytes. And it seems that you guys have the first technology to really apply that, that insight into a sports application use case. So I'm actually curious, um, my colleagues mentioned that this might have come from a clinical application uh, or a therapeutic application. Curious to hear the story of the technology behind precision hydration and also your personal story of how this became an interest for you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, your colleagues are dead right. It didn't. We haven't invented any novel technology here. We're we're using technology that that already existed largely. We've written some software and things, but uh, the. W- the technology was originally used to, and still is actually used in a lot of a lot of parts of the world to test and diagnose for cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic mm-hmm. condition. Which um, one of the characteristics that people, that doctors can spot, is increased loss of sodium chloride in sweat. So the sweat test was originally developed for that purpose, and we we were the first people to really take it in in a large way and use it with athletes. Athletes have done sweat tests for many years and there's been a lot of research done in that area. So people have typically collected sweat using different methodologies and analyzed it in the lab. But we took this uh, at rest sweat testing technology and started using it with athletes about uh, probably about 10 years ago now. And yeah, that's, that's kind of, that, that's where the technology comes from. The story of why we started doing it was quite a personal one for me. I was racing Ironman triathlon, often in the heat in places like Hawaii, and fi- finding that whilst my performances in the cool were pretty good, my performances in the heat were terrible. And a lot of the symptoms that I showed were 
um, consistent with hydration issues, electrolyte loss, hypernatremia, which is where you overhydrate and under replace salt. I ended up in the medical tent a couple of times. And so there was kind of a personal journey which led me down this line of, of figuring out that actually I was someone with very high sweat and sodium losses. I needed a test to help me diagnose that. And then once I'd found it out, I was able to go on and compete in the heat without any problems. Very cool. So that's an interesting lens. So this really came from an application or insight from you personally. So when you were an elite Ironman triathlete, how how did you come across the technology? Uh, um, what was it? What was it? What was the insight? Or what was the you know? How did you you know connect cystic fibrosis to elite triathlons? Yeah, I, I started off basically where most people would start off these days with google just looking around and saying what you know typing in the word sweat test and salt test and things and nothing there was a few things came up and i read some interesting forums and some articles but it was pretty clear to me there was nothing in a wide scale being targeted at athletes to help them with with this so i did come across repeatedly came across the cystic fibrosis testing world which was completely separate online and in the real world to the, the group of you know groups of people that work with athletes so i ran right. i ran the idea past a friend of mine who's a medic he's a heart surgeon and i said look would this test actually test what i want to look for and he was like well yeah basically that that would and he kindly arranged for me to have a test actually and then and and he said to me because he'd he'd known about some of the problems that i'd had with racing and he said i bet that your score on this will be, you know, really, really high, almost off the charts. He said, because I've seen the state of you after these races. He'd even noticed that there was lots of white salt deposits on my kit and on my face after a race. Oh. And he said, this will be high. And sure enough, I came out and it was, it was super high. It's actually not the highest we've tested. We've tested quite a few people higher than me now, but for a while I, yeah. I kind of held the record in our sweat test games. That's interesting. So what what is the typical range and what, what are the units that you measure? We measure it in millimoles per litre and okay. a really, really low score. Scores that have been reported in the literature go down into the low single digits for millimoles. We've we've typically not seen many people below 12, 15 millimole. And realistically, okay. a low end for our population seems to be around the, the 20s, sort of 18 to 22, something like that at the high end. In non-CF groups, we see up to around about 100, maybe just over 100 millimole. Um, wow. that, that can be, and then with cystic fibrosis, we can see up to 130, 135 millimole. And then there's, a, so, there's kind of a bell curve in between. Yeah, so this is not a trivial difference. We're talking about real, I mean, it's like a 5X multiple difference in terms of salt usage, salt Yeah, I would, say, I would say on the extreme ends, 10 times, you know, it would be, would be what we tend to quote, you know, 10, 10 to 100 right. very roughly. And so, yeah. It's, it's, right. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying that the range, yeah. Sorry, so, yeah. like, yeah. Like, you, yeah. So, you're really getting, I'm just saying that, you know, from a layman, it's like, oh, everyone kind of sweats and everyone's sweats kind of salty. Maybe there's like 10% variance, 50% variance, but we're really set talking about, you know, 500, 1000% variance. I mean, this is a real difference that you're, you're seeing and detecting. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, when you then, what confuses people and what confused us at first is you then have to kind of multiply that up by someone's sweat rate as well. Because obviously some people, I, I know now in retrospect that not only do I have an unusually high sweat sodium concentration at about 85 to 90 millimole, but I have quite a high sweat rate as well. And then you multiply that up over the number of hours it takes to do an Ironman. It's very easy to see why I would run into the problems. I was losing, you know, 15 20 25 grams of, of sodium in that race which is 10 times more than we're recommended to eat in a day but other yeah. people you, if you look at the other extreme we meet people with a very low salt con uh, sodium concentration very low sweat rate they could be losing just a couple of grams in the same time period so it's when you you really see some big differences when you when you multiply up by by sweat rates and, and different durations of activity. Right. And how do you measure sweat rate? Is that something you also do as well? Yeah, we we measure it. So what we do in if we're time constrained with an athlete is we'll often just get them to estimate their sweat rate, not numerically, but we'll just get them to classify whether they think they're low, you know, moderate, high or very high. 
sweater right. with a lot of athletes who train and compete a lot they they know their bodies quite well and they can give you a reasonable estimation and then we we would put that into our algorithm to help determine what kind of drinks they might need um, for for the more for the professional athletes or the more advanced we would often either teach them how to do this or do it with them and measure their sweat rates during training sessions or competitions by weighing them before and afterwards so you would you basically take the change in body weight, correct for any fluid that they've drunk, and you get a you get an estimation of their sweat rate. Okay, so you can get pretty particular in terms of doing body weight adjustment in terms of how much fluid loss. But okay, okay that's pretty interesting. So it's uh, you're essentially building a formula for uh, sweat physiology. You know, the amount concentration times the flow rate equals overall loss during your activity. Absolutely, yeah. Um, interesting. Um, Perhaps for a, for a devil's advocate here, um, what if you just said, you know, just take a bunch of salt? Like, let's not be overly precise. Um, are we affecting people to have low salt uh, consumption overly negatively? Like, what are the levers that you're playing around here? So obviously, um, not enough salt. You're, you're crashing like yourself, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Too much salt. Uh, what's the danger on the other end of the spectrum? It, I think it's a really interesting question. It's one we get asked all the time. Um, acutely, ju say during a competition, I think that the the risk of taking a little bit more salt rather than a little bit less is I would I would always advise athletes to take a little bit more. Um, that doesn't mean to say you should just take loads. We would we'd always want to yeah. give a, a reasonably targeted amount, but the the reality with an athlete in competition is if they're sweating a lot they're sweating out a lot of of fluid and salt they'll also urinate out any extra either immediately or after the competition depending on the length of it so a little bit more is is not so much of a problem athletes who take a lot too much um we we had a case of a cyclist who took a too much or we heard of this during one of the grand tours i think it was the tour of italy or not it may have been the vuelta one of the hot tour um for cycling events he was given very strong salt supplements by the team because it was hot they all were and he actually gained weight over a number of days because he was absorbing so much and retaining so much fluid it wasn't until they took him off the salt supplements he was able to sort of start peeing it out and he lost he, he normalized his weight again so right. so in a short time span or chronically you can retain extra fluid if you take on too much salt but for most people that that wouldn't be such an issue we always say this isn't like hitting a barn door not hitting a bullseye on a target we just need to get it about right for the athlete so right. more sweat more salt try taking extra you know see how you feel see see how your body reacts um and then if you're not sweating a lot or if you, your activities are a short duration or you're just not a big sweater it might be that you don't need electrolyte supplementation you might be fine with stocking up a bit before you go and then and then replenishing again afterwards it's, it, it is highly individual yeah no that makes sense and i actually just came back from a sports science uh summit and you know there's a couple key hot areas and you know traumatic brain injury concussion is is one yeah. popular area of discussion right now but of course personalization how do you periodize and cycle per individual athlete you know me as an athlete is going to be respond very differently to uh, a stressor than than someone like yourself so how do we curate and and, and help the athlete adapt so i think i, I think, think it's, yeah. it makes a lot of sense you're 100 percent right that's the way everything's going and and the yeah. nuance of that often gets lost in a lot of the older debates you know the, when you yeah. when you talk to people about hydration the debate the debates are very polarized do we drink to thirst or do, do, do we drink to a plan do we just drink right. water or do we need a sports drink and none of these questions have yes or no answers to them or or you know they 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 all require a look at the individual circumstance because we've worked with athletes who absolutely benefit from a very aggressive strategy of salt and fluid supplementation during the activities they're doing because of, because of what they're doing and because of the nature of their physiology and I'm talking about right. guys basically or girls that that are doing long duration very high intensity endurance exercise normally in the heat sweating a ton you know Tour de France riders, back-to-back -back days, Ironman athletes that are out there all day, um, you know, football players doing two-a-day practice in the in 
um, pre-season, that kind of thing. These people benefit from aggressive fluid and salt loading because they're losing so much. Right, right down the far end, you've got people who are going out and doing their local 5K park run. They're jogging a few times a week. They might do some yoga and stuff. These people don't need to be smashing a sports drink every day. And right. it's and it's completely, you know, the debate will never come up with the right answer for everyone. It's got to be case by case. I mean, arguably, you could give the, you could make the strong thesis that it's bad for people if they're smashing Gatorades that are just not, I mean, they're electrolytes. I mean, when Gatorades first invented in the 60s, it was an electrolyte drink. And yeah. now it's more of a, a sugar bomb, Yeah, uh, which is uh, kind of a devolution of what the purpose of that product was supposed to be. So if you're just slamming uh, essentially soft drink, luffle sugar twice a day when you're doing a 5K, you're you're basically you know on the track of giving yourself diabetes. Yeah, um, agreed. And I think that's yeah. part of the problem people have with the kind of sports drink industry. It's got a bad name these days because it's seen as it's seen as having been co-opted by you know by the sugar industry by. The, the soft drinks, the, the soda right. industry, because the big players, you know, Gatorade is owned by PepsiCo and Coca-Cola has its Powerade and it's just bought a big share, I believe, in Body Armor, which is another new up-and-coming sports drink. Yeah, co- so yeah. so I think quite rightly people are starting to kick back against these things again just because we're selling this as, you know, this is branded on all in the US, all of the major sports leagues, all around the, the fields, everything you see people drinking is Gatorade bottles, Right. And and it's kind of they've they've done that thing you know associate it with athletes make it look healthy it's a healthier alternative in reality it's not really but I don't even know if any team actually uses Gatorade I think I, I'm just like thinking about it I mean I think they have it they have it out there because it's required by contract yeah but the athletes themselves okay I mean I, we can't overly generalize because I think half the time the sports nutritionists are just trying to take the athletes off of like Skittles and candy bars. And then the other half are pretty dialed into their nutrition. Um, But I would say that more and more people realize that that's not what they need for optimal nutrition. Oh, definitely. I think, I mean, we've been in, in and around a lot of us sports teams because we do our sweat testing. We actually supply a lot of hydration drinks and products to major sports teams in the U S I've seen a reasonable amount of Gatorade drunk, but I see a lot of other products being used yeah. these days. And I see, I, I definitely can't name names because it would get someone into trouble, but I've seen one NFL team donating a lot of its Gatorade into a local high school you know, for, yeah. their, for their football team that doesn't have any, any major funding because they just yeah. can't get through the amount they get given. So yeah. people are becoming more sophisticated. A lot of people in sport and around sport realize that just because the guys are drinking a Gatorade bottle doesn't mean it's got Gatorade in it. Exactly. But, but you know, we've got a long way to go to break the, the mass public perception of that, I think. Right. But I don't want to go overly extreme here. There's a role for carbohydrate, role yeah. for sugar, for uh, exercise. So it's not like you don't need sugar, you just go full keto. That, that's incorrect. You want sugar for anaerobic uh, type uh, movements. So I'm actually curious with precision hydration, is that another variable that you offer your, your customers where you have electrolytes and you vary the electrolytes based on your sweat test results? Yeah. Are you looking for other... Uh, personalized variables for for your line or is it mostly just focused on electrolytes at the moment we're focused predominantly on electrolytes we we definitely understand though our products don't contain a lot of energy most of them a lot of them contain zero energy zero calories Mm -hmm. and then we have uh, one line of products that contains a very small amount of carbs so around about 2.5 to 3% carbohydrate solution when you compare that to say a Gatorade at 6 or 7% or a uh, soda at nine or ten percent is it's quite low in sugar and the idea right. of that one is that it's it just gives sometimes there's certain situations where athletes need that little bit of sugar in solution with electrolytes to help speed transit of fluid across the gut so it helps with that with regards to personalization we we definitely do a lot of one-to-one consultancy and work with athletes either just on email people who get in touch with us through our website or when we go into teams and work with them to figure out the nutrition strategies that go alongside that because for endurance sports in particular figuring out that that relationship of what do i need to drink and eat to perform at my best in different scenarios is is critical 
and you know de definitely we're seeing people moving away i think some of the time from liquid calories to more solid calories and gels and things if they're if they're doing long endurance events in the heat because they realize that the, the very sugary drinks can give them gut issues yeah and obviously nowadays there's a lot more interest in endurance athletes being more fat adapted and yeah. and and ketogenic or or using you know ketone supplements or whatever to right. to Im improve their metabolism from that point of view and so again it's it's so hard to generalize but it's 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 a case by case basis i know that my one of my colleagues um sean omani who i raced a swim run race with earlier this year he actually used the human ketones for the first yeah. time racing when we did this race and was amazed at how m how much less carbohydrate he consumed or how many less yeah. calories he consumed we were out there for a very intense event for about five and a half hours and he consumed very few additional calories just just um, water and salts it was pretty bad that's away. cool to hear yeah yeah that makes sense right like obviously a ketone ester is not going to reduce salt load or salt usage or salt expenditure but it's definitely going to preserve your glucose or glycogen reserve so it makes sense to stack something like precision hydration with the with the human with the hvo and ketone um very cool that's a that's a cool story and then i guess in terms of you know types of athletes it sounds like it's very similar with our experience with dealing with athletes that the cyclists the ultra performance endurance athletes tend to seem to be the earliest adopters for these technologies um I mean, I have a sense of why I think that's the case, but I'm curious to uh, perhaps hear your insight. You know, why is it, does it tend to be triathletes, cyclists, and then move towards something like basketball or, or American football? Good. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I don't know. I think culture has something to do with it in the sports, especially with sports like triathlon, where you've people who've done that sport have always been seen as early adopters it was a it was a very strange sport when it started in the 80s and um, even when i started it in the 90s we were little groups of people meeting up on a sunday morning running around in speedos and little tiny vests it was all a bit a bit strange with with aero bars on the bike and yeah. i think there was that that culture was embedded in it that we would within reason try anything new to an innovative to go a bit faster because when i started triathlon there was no one there were very few books even you know dave scott had written a book on how to train but the rest of the time you were you were asking other people who did the sport and you were making it up as you went along so there's a lot of room yeah. for individual innovation i think also because of the lack of that sort of club or team um, sports environment where you would be you would go into a system and be coached on how to do it you would you would freestyle it so part of it's that um, I think part of it also is that people who do these sports have um, pro probably are more affluent have a little bit more money to play with they're not afraid to throw a bit of money at, at trialing things and you know any, anything to go faster these you know, triathletes will spend ten thousand dollars on a on a bike happily days yeah. and five and a thousand dollars on a wetsuit and stuff so they're kind of they're yeah they're not afraid to to spend a few dollars to innovate as well so i think i yeah. think that's got a lot to do with it team sports on the other hand a lot of a lot of people who've worked in team sports for 20 30 40 years who are still in the system who are doing things the way they used to do teams just seem like a bit slower to pivot because they they're making a decision whereas an individual athlete is making a decision to trial something out that's that they're gonna their performance is gonna live and die by if you're in charge of i don't know the um new england patriots or someone right. if you're gonna implement something new and radical you better you better be damn sure it's gonna work because yeah. otherwise your job's on the line and i think there's a, a yeah, yeah. little bit of that yeah and then again there's like 60 80 guys and half of them are still eating candy bars and you're just like oh what's the biggest problem that i gotta solve yeah. in my in my busy schedule and i would say the last part and i think those those two points are are, are, are important where it's very individualized and experimental and two i agree with you the triathlete community is if we're you know, just looking at some of the market segments is one of the more affluent yeah. uh, demographics for sport, right? And, and yeah, people are buying $10,000 bikes. You're going to uh, South Africa to compete in a world championship Ironman, right? These are, you, you can't just 
go to your local basketball court and shoot some you know th- free throws. But I would say the last part that I think is interesting is the amount of quantified self and measurement yeah. in triathlon and cycling. I mean, people have these power meters to track their wattage, um, obsessed with Strava, which is you know measuring exactly their time and yeah. altitude and their uh, and, and, and their distance. Um, and obviously, if you're measuring to that level, then any single intervention is going to be helpful to actually see material difference. If you're not measuring it, how do you know if it works? Yeah. Um, and if you actually just are, are in that culture where you just constantly measure all these variables, then any single tweak you should be able to pick up. Yeah, I think you, I think you're 100 percent right. We've all got one of these yeah. expensive, expensive <laughs> the Garmin. On and it's always got yeah. uploads. Nowadays, it's amazing. I was talking to someone the other day. I used to log my training. I've, I've, I was an early adopter of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but now, it, but even in the past, I would tend to use it fairly selectively. So key workouts or times. But now, because these days, you know, it connects straight to the phone. It uploads everything automatically. You, it's so easy to log absolutely everything you do. And, yeah. and that can be a great thing. It can also be a bit of a dangerous thing for the addictive type personalities you get in, in sports or endurance sports, I think. But it's it's certainly... Yeah, you can measure it all and see what's happening with your performance. That's- yeah, I actually asked this question to uh, most guests who have some sort of experience here related to this. Uh, what is your thought on the quantified self? Um, and to give you a couple of sense of the polls, you have certain athletes who are all about it. You know, let me measure everything. Let me be a scientist. Let me be a biohacker. Let me tweak every single variable and obsess over the data. And then you have people on the other side of the spectrum that I would say are more just animal instinct, animal smell. Um, I just want to, I, I, I understand my body and the intuition around my body so well that don't give me all that stuff. That's a distraction. Let me just like be on my bike. Let me just be uh, on, on the road running and feeling it. What is your sense? Um, I mean, obviously I think there's value to both sides. I think you really converge, but you know, have you played with that philosophy uh, battle in your own head? I, I would say, having been fortunate to be around a lot of elite athletes over the years, either training and competing with them or now kind of working with them as an external consultant, the majority of the really top athletes that I've worked with tend to be more intuitive and more led by their, by their bodies. It doesn't mean that they all shun technology, but I think that they trust their body first and use use data to back up or add to what their instincts and things are telling them. I think that where I think athletes that are led a hundred percent by the data or or get too wrapped up in that can they lose something in that process potentially, especially when it comes down to racing. I think it depends what you're doing to a degree. If you were, if you're a, a track cyclist who's riding solo or a road time trialist, where it's all about aero position, many watts as you can for X amount of time, you can be quite a data. Being a data geek probably helps with that a lot. If you're more like a, a road race or a, a runner who's who's in a, a mass participation, a marathon, or where we, you know, you like you see at the front of the the marathons these days, it's largely all East Africans. None of them are wearing watches. They're going at it and they're right. racing each other, and it's man on man. You got to be, you got to live by your instincts there. And yeah. and so as a as a sports fan and as a as a fan of elite athletes in general, that's what I love to see. Is I love to see them without the technology, like people racing um yeah. i think though what's fascinating is then being able to record that stuff so maybe getting some of these guys to wear watches and, and collect data and then being able to retrospectively analyze it or i would love to work with with some athletes like that and and help them um you know maybe you could uncover some things from from measuring it and looking at it afterwards and i know that a, a lot a lot of people are into that yeah, I mean, I think that there's a sensible convergence of those two methods. I think um, when you're actually competing, you're not trying to look at your heart rate variability. Yeah. I mean, just go win the damn race, right? Like, why are you looking at data? Uh, but when you're in training, when you're reviewing, it's nice to have that data so you can actually tweak and play around. So I think there is, of course, value to both yeah. side of things. Um, curious to hear about your thoughts on, um, I don't know if you've read Alex Hutchinson's new book, I Endure. Have, yeah. Uh, we actually spoke to Alex last week, so um, it, it kind of our conversation there is percolating in my mind. Um, um, I think one of the biggest takeaways from that book was the story 
around Tim Noakes and Samuel Marcora and their approach towards sports science um, with the brain being the dominant organ, or at least a very important contributor to physical performance, yeah. right? Uh, psychobiological theory or the central governor theory, where the body is almost a sub input into the brain, and the brain ultimately decides whether you're going, you know, putting out more or putting out less. Yeah. Um, and some of the interesting results in, in terms of experience showed that for a, 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 a sugar drink, right? If you drink a carbohydrate drink, but you pump that carbohydrate out immediately yeah. through like a stomach pump, um, that athlete still performs better than yeah. placebo, someone just drinking water. Um, curious to get your sense of that kind of psychobiological effect on, 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 a, on an input and if there's any applications towards electrolytes. Uh, I don't think that's been studied, but curious to get your thoughts, you know, is that salt load helpful physiologically to, to control, you know, the, the ion sh shuttling in your, in your cells? I imagine that that's an important part of it, but I'm also wondering, is there a psychological effect? You'd have some salt in your mouth, your brain's like, ah, oh, we got some, we got some electrolyte. I think, and, I think there could well be. The closest that, yeah. that I think people have come to actually studying that formally is looking at the effect of pickle juice on cramping. So for instance, a lot yeah. of people, cramping is a whole debate in itself. You know, some people think cramping has got nothing to do with electrolytes. Some people think it's, it is the answer. The, again, the reality exists, I think in the gray area in between where sometimes cramps are, uh, people are predisposed to cramps with large fluent electrolyte deficits. And for many years, pickle juice with a high, very high sodium content has been used to to alleviate cramps in football players and other huh. people. Now, when you when they've measured it, you you put pickle juice in someone's mouth, and it can often it can alleviate a cramp, but it happens so fast that it's it's almost impossible. You have to rule out the fact that it's been absorbed and got down into the body at a cellular level. What it's done is it's they think it's maybe um, affected some receptors in the mouth, which then go on to create a, a cascade of events in the central nervous system with it, which then allow the muscles to relax. So there are some products on the market that are claiming to be able to to sort of hmm. take take advantage of that, which is a really interesting theory actually. I also think right. on a purely, if you like, the, the purely placebo or psychological level though, definitely that car carbohydrate mouth rinsing has been proven to be effective. And I certainly think that if you've got athletes who've got, a, uh, especially if they've had a past history of problems with you know, sodium depletion or hyponatremia or cramping, you put a salty tasting drink in their mouth, that's going to make them feel good. And anything that makes you feel good can give you that little bit, that little bit more gas, basically. Yeah. There becomes a point yeah. when, you know, when, if you're becoming so dehydrated, sodium depleted, blood volumes dropping so much that your performance is going to fall off, you're going to need to drink something and absorb it for it to have a, a, a cast iron physiological effect. But like you yeah. said, that book, Alex's book, was was so good at, at pointing out how blurred that line is between what is a psychological effect and what is a, a physiological effect, and the fact that the two are effectively intertwined. And yeah, it's it's really it's really really interesting. Yeah. I mean, my, my quippy takeaway from that book is that the best way to train is to trick your brain or train your brain. But the best way to train your brain is to actually just do the damn exercise. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it ends up being just exercise a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm actually curious to dive in. Yeah, I'm actually curious what you, yeah. And any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I agree largely. I think that there's, there's elements, by understanding it, there's other things you can take away. I definitely took a lot away from it, something that I'd already figured out over the years anyway. But if I've got hard training to do, I have to do it first thing in the morning. I have two very young kids and pretty busy job now. And by the end of the day, I'm, I'm spent, even if I've not lifted a finger with training. So. Right. I've been swimming hard lately for a, a swim run race I'm doing. If I've got a four four k swim set to do, that has to be at six in the morning because I have to get out of bed, have a coffee, and go. And then I then I can give it a hundred percent. But mentally, it's so it's challenging. If I tried to do that at seven p.m., I would just not get the performance. Your brain is exhausted. So it was great. It was great to have yeah. that reinforced because it kind of. Yeah, I'd fallen into that habit many years ago of training first thing in the morning, but 
to understand that actually it's a real thing and you're, you're not just being a bit of a wimp is quite good. Or it's like if you actually do that seven o'clock race or, or practice after all that work through the day, it's more of a harder ad adaptative yeah. uh, training session. So it's like an extra bonus training yeah. session. Um, I'm actually curious to dive into the physiology of cramping. I mean, just as we've all cramped, I mean, I think every, you're a professional athlete, you're just someone that did physical education as a 15 year old you know, boy or girl, we've all cramped. Um, what is the best explanation of what's going on there, right? We kind of get, you get kind of the tightness in our side, doesn't feel that good. And then you kind of walk it off. What's, what's going on there? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And no one understands cramping fully. I mean, when you get cramps in large muscle groups during exercise, the typical ones would be, you know, um, someone's pulling up with a cramp in their hamstring or their calf when they're sprinting or, or, or running at the end of a, a football game or something like that. That's kind of a, it's like a tetanic muscle contraction where the muscle just goes into spasm and just keeps over contracting. And in the, sh mm -hmm. in the instant, the only way to really relieve it is to, is to stretch it very gently. And then what you find is that that, that causes the cramp to relax because you put, you reverse the pressure on it the golgi tendon organs which control the muscle firing they they send signals out for it to relax and the muscles relax um it's it has no one has ever come up with a great theory that completely encompasses why muscles would cramp you know part of it i think is that it's a way of the body slowing you down you know when you're pushing the limits be that very explosively and very fast or whether it's in endurance exercise when you're becoming depleted in terms of fluids and electrolytes and carbohydrates and other and fuel if you you if you start to cramp you have to slow it's a way of your body it's a way of your body saying no enough is enough we've got to slow down here we're running we've got to walk because we've got to ease this cramp out we've we've definitely we talk sort of in in a jokey way talk about different flavors of cramp because we see it with with different we see it with triathletes a lot of triathletes will get cramp in the swimming pool if they do a bike or a run session and then they jump in the swimming pool and try and do some kicking they kick to it or pushing off the wall they get cramp in their feet and it's very yeah. hard to pin a cramp like that on electrolyte depletion because quite often the preceding exercise hasn't been long enough they're not all that dehydrated it seems to be something neuromuscular you know you're taking the foot from a position where it's very loaded to a position where it's it's unloaded but you're you're asking it to do uh, an, an opposing action and neuromuscularly it doesn't like it it goes into spasm and it seems those kind of cramps within reason tend to get better with practice so they get better with fitness mm -hmm. and with training other cramps the cramps i used to get when i was doing an ironman would start off usually in my quads on the run and I'd feel my quads sort of nipping away and I could tell that a cramp was coming. Then it might start nipping in the, in the calves as well and hamstrings. And before you know it, it could be full blown cramps in both legs. And they would definitely, as far as I'm concerned, were electrolyte and fluid depletion related because as soon as I was able to get salt and fluid back in, walk it off a few minutes later, I could be back running again. And we see, yeah. We see numerous cases of that with people that, that contact us who've, who've been doing endurance exercise for a long time, increasing problems with cramps, especially in longer and hotter events. We put them on a regime of more aggressive sodium in relation to the fluid they're taking in. And, and sort of, I would say seven or eight times out of 10, it proves to be the, it proves to, so, it solves the problem. Putting your finger on exactly why it does that is very very difficult it's been suggested it's to do with the um it's to do with the um uh, the ratio of, of of fluid and um sodium inside and outside of the the muscle cells the pressure that that creates because you right. get extracellular and intracellular fluid shift there's um, obviously sodium uh, is involved in in muscle contraction and in nerve impulses so there could be there could be causes there but it's a, it's a tricky one to study. And I think that's part of the issue is that setting up a study where you, where you, where you actually research cramping in a sports science lab is almost impossible to reliably yeah. create cramping. And it's, and it's also quite unethical. So, you know, to going back to the Alex Hutchinson thing about the mind and body connection, I would also argue that cramps tend to happen with athletes very often when they're pushing themselves extremely hard, which tends to ha happen mm. in competition. 
Now, some yep. athletes can push themselves very hard in controlled conditions in the lab, but they very few will push themselves as hard as they can when they're uh, compared with when they're you know going to catch a ball that they've got to catch to score a touchdown or to right. overtake a rival or to climb a mountain. Yep. So it's a tricky one. We're a long way from resolving all of that one. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. It's I, it sounds very similar actually to uh, the emerging research around traumatic brain injury and concussion, where there's yeah. not great biomarkers for that, and of course the ethical side. I mean, every yeah. single TBI concussion is different, and you're not going to just like drop bricks at 50 pounds of force on someone's head and just measure, you know, can we can we rescue okay. the damage, right? And I, I can see the similar challenges with cramping. Everyone cramps a little bit differently. Yeah. How do you how how do you correct for that variation of the etiology of where that cramp comes from and the severity of the cramp? Those are a lot of variables to correct for. Yeah, and I think what a lot what a lot of people do is they potentially, if cramps are related to sodium and fluid imbalance, people sometimes make it worse because dehydration has been labelled as a cause for cramp. Mm -hmm. And so what people will do is drink more water, and then and then they end up diluting the body further, diluting the sodium levels in the body further, which can make it worse rather than better. Right. So when you look at a lot of the literature outside of sport around people getting hypernatremia in hospitals through various reasons. Um, when you look at kidney dialysis, dialysis patients who have the um, amount of sodium in their system dialed up and dialed down, all of these people exhibit quite a lot of cramping, and that's listed as a symptom when their sodium levels drop too low. So in a completely different scenario, we get people cramping when, they, when we mess about with their sodium and fluid levels. Right. But, but it's just in a different domain. And I don't think many people have looked at that research and then crossed it over with, with sport to see if there's any correlation there. No, that's a good actually segue to something I wanted to ask you about, or at least discuss with you around uh, Professor Tim Noakes' idea about being water clogged, waterlogged. Yeah. Um, it, traditionally, I think if you look at the arc of sports science, Hydration was one of the key buzzwords probably, I don't know, maybe like 20 years ago where like everyone's yeah. underhydrated. Make sure you drink a lot of water, a lot of water, a lot of water. Yeah. And Noakes is saying, hey, everyone is just full of water. It's worsening their performance. Um, right. Do you drink to thirst? Do you just drink a lot yeah. of water all the time? Uh, let's dive into that. Help, help us unpack this here. What are your latest yeah, thoughts there? It's it's a massive topic, and again, another one that we get challenged on all the time. Because I think what Noakes has done with that book, Waterlogged, and with all these research, is is definitely highlight a huge issue, which is over drinking. So there's a there are a lot of athletes that consider dehydration to be the root cause of all athletic ills, and right. just drink and drink and drink and drink. It's like it's almost like you can't drink too much. So just you know, just keep topped up. You've got to be peeing when you pee. It's got to be clear. Um, it's you've got to pee loads all the time. If you're not, you're not properly hydrated. Right. Um, there's there's this. I grew up through that era in the '90s. You know, if you weren't if you weren't carrying a water bottle around with you as a sports science student, you were doing it all wrong. You know, you needed just to be drinking the whole time. Right. And and so in that dimension and the, all the cases of hypernatremia, which is really what got Tim Noakes interested in this, which is where people dilute their blood sodium levels down to critical levels, they that has been shown. The principal problem with people getting hypernatremia is over drinking. So they just drink beyond the dictates of thirst, fill themselves up and, and have problems. And and to a large extent, I don't I don't have a problem. I think what Noakes has done there, ninety percent of what he's saying is is really good and athletes should listen to it. It's the counterpoint to thirty years of Gatorade marketing saying you need to drink more. Right. And it's a natural it's the natural, you know, um, it's the natural reaction to that after an amount of time. Where I think there is a problem with it though is it's yeah, just Tim Noakes' his take home message from Waterlogged is just drink water to thirst. That's it. Yeah. And for a lot of people, a lot of the time that's good advice. When when you get though into endurance athletes doing very long training sessions or races, when you get into football players doing two practices a day in the summer heat, anyone who's just exercising in a hot environment, sweat and sodium losses can be very high. And there's it, there's a lot of evidence some of it's anecdotal, but some of it's good published research as well to show that by adding sodium and fluids together 
to rehydrate and, and um, maintain blood volume and blood sodium levels, you get a better performance effect and a better health effect than you do from just drinking water alone. And I think that's where, the, again, that nuance is lost in this debate. We've gone from sports drinks are all you need to drink. Well, we started off actually before Gatorade and everything. No one was allowed to drink during exercise. So we went from you know, don't drink anything at all through to drink as much Gatorade as you can to Tim Noakes, just drink a bit of water when you're thirsty. And right. th these are all sound bites and they're not telling the complete picture. When we've published some research earlier this year where we looked at two very interesting cases, people who got hyponatremia, one was a cystic fibrosis patient and they have this, remember, they have this very high salt loss in their sweat. And this guy was a um, young adult working in Haiti as an aid worker, drinking lots of water and some Gatorade, trying to stay hydrated, and then ended up in the ER with hyponatremia because he diluted his body sodium levels so low. We found another case, which is very, very similar in terms of looking at the the numbers in the in the hospital report from a lady who was doing an Ironman triathlon in the US who'd also drunk some sports drinks and some water but had but had got hyponatremia and she when we tested her we did a sweat test with her she had very very high salt losses in her sweat as well a bit like I do and I've I've suffered you know mild case of hyponatremia in the past and we were able to get this piece published in the BMJ not as a not not directly as an attack on Tim Noakes by any stretch, but as a counterpoint to the suggestion that it's only over drinking that can cause hyponatremia. Because when you are losing salt and water in a, a, a high rate, the higher the rate of salt loss, the less fluid you need to drink to cause relative dilution in the body. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively simple, straightforward concept. Right. But it's it, until recently, it's not been very widely accepted. And so we're trying to change that opinion a little bit and saying, look, as much as the principal problem with, 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 hy with hyponatremia is over drinking, and Tim Noakes has got that dead right, we have to draw the line though and say it's not the only reason. People with very high s sweat salt losses, and a really interesting group to study with this is hyponatremic, is, sorry, is, is cystic fibrosis patients. Because in hot weather, when they exercise, CF patients are far, it's accepted they have a far higher risk of hyponatremia. Mm -hmm. So if we then just go down that continuum a little bit and go, what about the guys who've got, haven't got CF but are losing 100 millimoles of sodium per liter? Surely their risk it's is higher. higher. Yep. So it's all, a, it's just a, we all exist on this continuum somewhere. Yeah. And, and that's, I think that's a very interesting concept and one that we're working with a, a CF doctor called Dr. Doug Lewis and uh, a, a researcher called Dr. Tamara Hugh Butler, who is actually one of Tim Noakes' students mm. in Cape Town, and she's been working on this with us. Um, and yeah, like I say, we got this paper published, and hopefully, it's the first of a few in in that vein that we're trying to get out there. Very cool. I mean, getting the randomized control trial, at least a peer-reviewed published papers, is uh, quite an endeavor. So, congrats on that. I, I want to dive into a little bit on on, on on the research side, but I want to just comment on the notion that. It, it just seems that within the mainstream of sports science that people like simple answers. And you know, as an engineer by background or a computer scientist by background, I, I think perhaps engineers are more comfortable with just spectrums or continuous uh, distributions as opposed to just like a polar like on or off binary switch. Yeah. Um, but like I think through the good work of, of, of folks like yourself and just the broader movement in the space, I think people are starting to be able to handle more variables. But I think just from someone that might've come from a, just a different background into the space of human performance, it just seems that like, okay, the human physiology has, you know, a, a lot of variables. And I think it is obviously easier if you're an athlete to think about one or two variables like water and like salt. And then those are only two variables I need to think about. But obviously as we're talking about with the specific case of just electrolytes, there's, you know, the amount of salt load, you know, the millimoles that you're losing and the amount of total fluid loss, right? There's like all these variables and um, maybe it just takes time for people to just realize that, um, a human system, like any other system, 
is a system that encapsulates much more than just one or two variables to think about. I think I think you you're a hundred percent correct with that, and it's a problem that we have all the time because we'll get challenged by people who who will ask, well, you know, I thought you needed to drink just water. You're telling me I need this, you know, or the the classic ones in sport recently that I can remember are, and you'll you'll be very familiar with this one with what you guys do is carbohydrates. You know, you either you either are pro carbohydrate and think you should eat it you know, three times a day right. and in between meals and all the time, or you're anti carbohydrate. Right. You're a keto you fanatic. Want, yeah, you you <laughs> you just live on you just live on bacon. Yeah. Um, almonds. <laughs> but 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 they and we saw it we saw it not too long ago as well when running with with shoes you know um barefoot shoes or ultra cushioned shoes right. or st- you know, stability shoes right. um they, they always seem like you say they always seem to be polarized and and people want the answer they want a sound bite they don't want to necessarily and we're all guilty of it in our our, i think well we can be until it gets pointed out outside of your kind of domain main domains of interest and expertise it's very easy to go looking for what's the the quickest best easiest solution for this you know someone walks up into a running store and they're like what are the best running shoes are they ones with no with no sole you know with just a flat sole or with a big cushion sole right and it's like well you need to sit that person down and start a whole long conversation about what kind of running they're doing and what their background is and what kind of foot shape they've got. And you got to, and, and ironically where you end up with a lot of these things is with all the intelligence that you can put into it, going out and trying it is a big part of figuring out what works for you because we can think about some of the variables. So we always say this to people who have a sweat test. We measure their, their, their salt loss. We look at their, sweat rate if we can we look at the type of activity they're doing the duration the intensity the environment and then we give them we have an algorithm which then gives them a a recommendation on what kind of volume and what kind of strength of hydration products to use but it has to say in very big letters you know you need to go out and try this and test and adjust and work with us to dial it in to make it make it 100 percent yours yeah because that's how you actually get the best result and yeah, being on being comfortable with the fact that there's not a right answer or a wrong answer. There's just degrees of being a little bit more wrong or more right, and somewhere in the middle fits. It you know exists your right answer. Right is is very important. Yeah, I mean, I understand from a sports physiologist perspective. Okay, you got to have some best practices to recommend to people because yeah. people want simple answers, and I understand that you just cannot tell everyone all the nuances all the time, otherwise no. information overload. Um, so I understand the desire to have a kind of a simple framework or discussion, um, but let's not take that to mean the complete picture. Obviously with each individual, there's nuances and let's not obfuscate the details for the sake of expediency of explanation. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell, because if you, if you dumb it, you have to, sometimes you have to dumb things down to get people to get started, to help them over the line, to try something new or to try something to push them in the right direction. But you can't then just kind of exist with that being the be all and end all of your advice or your offering yeah. because then you do miss out on all the good stuff, the figuring out the details. Right. So Andy, it sounds like you actually have some research going on. So uh, what's in the research pipeline? Uh, what are the collaborators and, and what are you guys most interested in? And then how can we expect to see your work and uh, the broader precision hydration work continue to evolve? Yeah, we are. We're trying to be more and more active in the world of research, I think, for two for two reasons. The first one is because we have a genuine curiosity to find out new and novel things or to add to the existing knowledge base out there about about hydration and and push it all forward the second reason is that you know we're a small but growing company and in order to be taken seriously in in what we do quite rightly you have to be doing some you know you have to be publishing some science putting some data out there so what what we're looking at at the moment is we're actually hopefully going to be co-funding a phd program for for a candidate starting next year in 2019 to 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 do all sorts but the the basic the where we want to end up is we want to look at performance trials that evaluate the effectiveness of different levels of of personalized um, electrolyte replacement on endurance exercise in the heat 
because I think that that's where this all started and that's where I was having problems and where I think there's a lot to be learned because we have all these great war stories and anecdotes from the field of how people have or have, have done brilliantly or failed on different strategies. We want to put some of those to the test, which is going to mean some some very long, hot laboratory sessions, I think, with people doing some pretty nasty performance trials and seeing yeah. seeing how they get on. On the way to that, though, there's a lot of other stuff that we want to do. And we've, we've started recently with just looking at some reliability and um, uh, accuracy trials, looking at the equipment that we use for sweat testing and comparing that to the what we'd call the traditional methods of sweat testing. So putting patches on the body, getting athletes to run around. We, we test people with a sweat sample that, that's taken from the forearm. Now, we understand it, with the best will in the world that is not – going to be totally representative of, of sweat from every other site on the body mm-hmm. we we believe from some of the work that we've done that it's quite representative it's a good place to start with and certainly if we want to put people in a bucket and say you're a low medium high or very high salt sweater then we can do that from that site but what what would be really interesting is to actually you know take some full sweat um results from some people compare them with the forearm sweat and maybe see if there's we can be a little bit more accurate with what Mm, we're doing so we're we're literally talking to some people at Loughborough University in the UK at the moment who may be able to conduct that type of study with us then uh, I think between that and the performance trial there's there's other things to look at with just general you know sodium supplementation versus placebo um, in in some lab trials and in some competitions. There's a great uh, piece of work done by some researchers in Spain a few years ago where they blinded a bunch of subjects doing a half Ironman triathlon in the heat, gave them all some capsules which either had salt in or, or just had a placebo in there, and they got a very strong positive result with mm. the athletes taking the salt capsules because those athletes, they were allowed to drink as much as they wanted, going back to Noakes's, you know, drink to thirst. They chose to drink more, probably because they were thirstier, because they were ingesting salt, right. which kept their blood volume higher, which led to them being, on average, quite a few minutes faster over a half Ironman. So I think we'd like to look at those kind of studies in the field and see if we can replicate some of those results, because, you know, obviously that's of, of a great deal of interest to us. Yeah, that'd be... Uh a good sort of proof is in the pudding type of result that you can show, you know, an NFL team or, or, or all the other customers curious, yeah. you know, are you guys also looking to bring some of the new research back into therapeutics, the the clinical side of things as well, or is that, um, are you guys solely focused on the sports performance? We are pretty focused on sports performance, but one area where it crosses over quite a lot is with the work of Dr. Doug Lewis, who I mentioned a few minutes ago. We we published a paper with him already, and um, Doug is a is an interesting character because he's a CF doctor, is his mm-hmm. main day job, so he's working with a lot of CF um, patients. But he's also an Ironman triathlete himself, and he's very into sport. He's also like a world champion sweater as well. He can sweat more than any other man we've ever met, I think. So (laughs) he's a a great colleague for us. And he's got a a strong interest in looking at the hydration requirements for his CF patients because a lot of them are, are... even if they're not doing sport, they might be doing. They might just be building a house, or you know, working out in the summer heat, or digging a garden, or like this this guy um, working as an aid worker in Haiti or whatever. And we we're working with Doug to try and you know use what we learn from heavy sweating sports people to say, okay, can we advise CF patients a bit better? Because Doug's belief is that their current evidence based guidelines for fluid and salt replacement aren't very good. Yeah, um, they're not they're, because CF. Unfortunately, people suffering with CF until relatively recently didn't live very long. Mm. Now they're living into their twenties, thirties, forties. So they're they're living a much fuller and more normal life with, and hopefully with more exercise involved. So there's kind of an emerging emerging subgroup there where I think I would like to think some of what we learn can can go into there and, and vice versa. So that could be. That yeah. could be quite Yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, this is a fascinating conversation. I mean, I think um, it's one of these topics where I, I think just growing up in in a somewhat sport-focused life, I mean, I think almost all of us learn something in like physical education classes around sport, that hydration is something that's so baked 
you know, drilled into all of us. And I think it's helpful to just unpack some of the confusion and, and, and subtle points around hydration. So where do people find out more about your work? I mean, so there's the sweat testing. I know you have different centers or areas yep. that do that. Where do people find you online? What's the, what's the download in terms of all the ways to access and learn and, and keep up with your work? Definitely the best place to start is precisionhydration.com, which is our website. It's a largely consumer-facing website where people can do a free online sweat test, mm -hmm. um, which is which uses an algorithm that we've developed based off of the results of a lot of our proper sweat tests. So basically, you you answer some questions and it and it says to you, right, we can't say for sure, Jeff, but it sounds like you're going to be a guy who needs you know this this type of drink for this type of activity, and then you can go give it a try. And we have a lot of people that do that, so that's mm -hmm. a really good place to start. Uh, we've also got a a tab on the website which is the hydration advice tab which is actually becoming more of a blog it does it does have a lot of hydration advice in there but it has a lot of general performance articles as well just kind of areas of, of interest they we're on we're on all the usual social media like facebook precision hydration twitter um, twitter is at the sweat experts we we try to tweet um all sorts of um, you know useful stuff on there and Instagram is at Precision Hydration as well. And through any of those, they can DM us. We're, we're a pretty friendly bunch. We try and get back to everyone. Um, so we're not just <laughs> sat here ignoring the messages. <laughs> if people want to reach out and email us or they can always email hello at precisionhydration.com as well. We'll always get back to them. Awesome. Thanks so much for the time, Andy. No worries. Thanks for having me on. We got to hang out in person next time, either when you're in San Francisco or when I'm in, in the UK. I'll drop you a line. There is always an open invite down in our offices. All right. Cheers, Andy. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. As always, please send my producer Zill and I feedback at podcast at hvmn.com. iTunes reviews are always appreciated. And remember, you'll score a free Sprint Mini in the process. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And talk to you soon.